You're listening to Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Hey. Hi. (laughs) That was a very timid hi. (laughs) It's because I'm in a mood. I'm sorry. Everyone's like, that's not news. (laughs) (laughs) It's not. I'm sorry. Uh, Before we get into this podcast episode, I want to talk about what you've probably already heard us mention a couple times by now. But if you haven't signed up, we're doing a free workshop uh, next Friday. Almost in January. Wow. (laughs) June. We're not that far into the year. We're literally halfway (laughs) through the year. June 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern. There will be a replay. It's so funny. We say it a million times and inevitably like eight people email us like, will there be a replay? I'm like, (laughs) yes, there will be. It'll probably expire, though. So I'm not not sure when, but it it will. Definitely. But there will be a replay because we know not everyone can make it at that time. And that's fine. fine. It's during a work day for most people. So, okay, it's called Three Ways to Get Unstuck in Your Career and Life in Record Time, which sounds... It sounds like we're going to give you quick fixes, but if you know us at all, we don't do quick fixes. You know, that's not how we do. So when I say record time, what I mean is you are probably tired of yourself. You've probably gotten to the point where you feel really stuck and you feel so over it. And you're like, just tell me something that will help me break the cycle of wanting to move forward, wanting to change, but not being able to. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to come in and we're going to inject, we're going to like kind of shake up the rut that you are in and help you move forward. And we are definitely going to get you unstuck in record time compared to you trying to do it on your own, which is what you've probably (laughs) been doing up until now. How's that working for you? (laughs) So sometimes getting some expert guidance can absolutely speed up the process. We've done this a bunch of times by now. Yeah, we're like expert mechanics. We've fixed a million of these cars before. Okay. (laughs) We know what's wrong with your car (laughs) or if not, we can figure it out. Not to call you all cars or anything, but but it's a good analogy. Just go with it. Okay. (laughs) You don't have the access understandably to the same tools and fuel and diagnostic info that Kristen and I have earned over many, many years of quote unquote fixing cars. Let's let it be clear. I know nothing about actual cars, (laughs) but the human analogy, I know a lot about that. So it's really nice to get out of your head and to be like kind of like shaken a little bit in a good way. And that's what we're going to do. And to be guided instead of feeling like you have a blindfold on and you're feeling your way out of the dark. Yeah. No. Hello. Did Have you listened to our podcast intro? You probably have like 50 times by now. <laughs> that's the whole point. You don't have to do that by yourself. So don't come to our workshop <laughs> on the 22nd and we're we'll going to help a, you get unstuck. Yes. We'll have a registration link. In the episode description. Yeah, that's all you have to do. Look for it. Register. We want to see you there. And uh, yeah, that's what, a week from now? Uh Uh-huh. Okay. You'll probably hear us talk about that a lot more. So if you would rather not be annoyed, just sign up for it. And then we're (laughs) going to keep talking about it. But at least you'll be like, well, I'm going. (laughs) So (laughs) it'll be satisfying in that way. Sure. Whatever. (laughs) Okay. And if you don't want to come, that's also fine. I'm not here to pressure you. But like, come on. (laughs) I know this is relevant to you, is what I'm saying. Anyway. Also, we don't do free workshops that often. No, we really don't. This is this is kind of a rare thing. We don't do live things. Kristen and I really don't like being live most of the time. <laughs> Takes a lot of effort. We have to put makeup on and stuff. I know. Ugh. The whole thing. Anyway, so we'll put our effort in for you. Okay. Wow, that was enough of that. <laughs> okay. So, so our side chat yeah, this week. Yeah. I don't have a plan for this because that's not really the point of side chats for we the most really part. Do. 
there's been a couple times when we broke that rule because it was necessary. Like the people pleasing episode. We well, needed. because there's so <laughs> much. And what honestly, sometimes we create a plan to rein ourselves in. Otherwise, oh, yeah. you'll listen to us for two hours. And I'm we know you don't really want that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. So here's a problem. <laughs> Most people are walking around under the very misguided assumption that there is one thing that you are meant to do in this life and you're probably meant to do it for your job and you're probably meant to get paid for it. And what you really need is to go find it and figure it out and discover it. And then once you find that thing, then life becomes beautiful and full of color and you're happy and everything works out and rainbows and butterflies and blah, blah, blah. That's this belief. So that's why there's all these sayings about find your passion and discover what lights you up and all of these things as if follow your bliss, as if you could like turn around the corner and be like, ah, there you are. I've been looking for you. Right. Except now we can be together (laughs) and never be apart (laughs) and live happily ever after. Right. That's not creepy at all. Did you see how it got slightly more (laughs) ominous? Yeah. Well, but that's okay. So there is an amazing talk that Elizabeth Gilbert, author of Eat, Pray, Love and Big Magic. Stay tuned. We're actually going to do a bonus episode in a couple of weeks because we have five Fridays in the month instead of four. So we're going to actually do a special episode about Big Magic, just about that book. So if you want to read it before. Yeah, you should go read it first. We do that episode. You should. You don't have to read it to be able to get a lot out of our discussion. No, we're just but- gonna- you know, you might kind of think that's kind of fun. Yeah. So in Big Magic, which we will get into a lot more in a couple of weeks, Liz talks about this amazing concept that I've blogged about before, but it was time to bring this back and delve into it deeper of hummingbirds and jackhammers. And I love this. It's so, first of all, it's very visual. <laughs> a jackhammer is what we just described. It's the kind of person, and they are very rare, okay? Like 5% of the population is the kind of person who has always known what they wanted to do. Like they just, Liz is like, I was one of these people. I was born knowing I wanted to write and I never wavered from that. And so when I told people just, you know, do what you love, I thought they knew what they wanted to do. Like I knew what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that 95% of people aren't like that and they're not supposed to be. There's nothing wrong with them for not, sticking to one thing and loving it so hard that they just do it forever. That is not normal. Can I repeat? (laughs) That is not normal. My mom is one of these people. She's totally a jackhammer since she was probably six or seven. She knew she wanted to be a nurse. She studied to become a nurse. She was a nurse. She is still a nurse. She will always be a nurse. She loves being a nurse. It never crossed her mind to be anything else. And I tell her all the time, mom, you realize how rare that is. Yeah. How few people have that kind of certainty. And honestly, how few people want that level of certainty and like doing the same thing forever. Like she loves it. That really suits her. That doesn't actually suit most people. She might be actually the only person I know who is a true jackhammer. I might have had one or two clients along the way. I think of other people and I really, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. And And it's rare. A lot of people. <laughs> I've met a lot of people. And I, I know hardly any true jackhammers. And jackhammers because they just literally drill down on one thing with like uber laser focus forever. Yeah. That's it. So most people are this other camp that we call, we don't call, Liz Gilbert calls hummingbirds. Right. And also understandable. They flit from thing to thing. Right. Exactly. If you look at a hummingbird, they're always, they're kind of constantly in motion, flitting from one flower to the next, to the next thing. But when they're focused on it, they're really focused. They're like laser focused. They're there while they're there. Flower. And then they're flitting all around again. And then they're not there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's most of us. That's a good description of how most of us approach life and particularly this idea of passion, which is we get really interested and curious about something. And then we move on. And most people are terrified to hear that. And they don't want to be that because of so many reasons that we'll get into. But most people want to be, wish they were a jackhammer. Well, because... Because it would be simpler. Because it would be easier. Yes. And then they judge themselves for not being a jackhammer. Yeah. And they think there's something wrong with me. I must be broken because I don't know what one thing lights me up that I want to do. 
That is one of the biggest misconceptions you could possibly make in your entire life, okay? And maybe I'm being dramatic about that. And maybe it's because I'm so steeped in this that I see it everywhere. And I think it's a bigger problem than it is. I I think it's a pretty big problem. I think it's a pretty big problem. I think most people are under this assumption that there is something wrong with them for not knowing what is the one thing they want to do with their lives. And what they don't realize is that there's no such thing for 95% of people. 95% of people. I mean, like, that's not super scientific, but... That's what Liz says she thinks. And I agree with her. I agree. And that, I mean, even if it's 90% of people, okay, it's still the vast, vast majority of people. So you are not weird. No. You are not broken. You're actually much more, quote unquote, normal if we're just talking about majority of humans. So why do we want to be Jack Cameras when none of us really are? One. I don't know how long this list is going to be. I'm making it up as I go. (laughs) It would be convenient, okay? It would just be more convenient if you picked one thing and it lit you up and you could just do it forever. Most of us are a little bit lazy. And I'm not saying that to cast aspersions. I like being lazy personally. (laughs) I just mean that humans like homeostasis. We're always seeking stability and balance. And so... I think we like the idea of setting it and forgetting it. Like we like the ability to go on autopilot when we want to. And so it scares us and it triggers the fear of the unknown to think that you could pick something and then it change in a year or two years. The part of us that doesn't like change and doesn't like the unknown, the part of us that's, you know, like our inner critic who wants us to play it safe and be small and not take risks, likes the idea of things never changing so it can always predict what's going to happen. So the part of you that wants to be a jackhammer, if you're not a jackhammer, isn't really authentic. It's probably coming more from a place of fear and discomfort with the unknown rather than like a true desire. Yes, yes. So number two in this list that we're making up as we go along (laughs) sure, is it would be, well, we think it would be a lot more socially acceptable to be a jackhammer because then at networking events and parties and Christmas dinner, when your family or anyone asks, hey, what are you doing? You would have a built-in answer, really easy, would not be questioned by anyone. You would say, I am doing blank. I am passionate about blank. My career is blank. It would be like a one sentence, one little phrase response that would be really neat and tidy versus well, I was doing this, but now I'm kind of curious about this, but I'm actually maybe thinking about me going back to school. And I would love this idea of starting a side business, but I'm kind of just figuring it out right now. That feels more complicated <laughs> and you're afraid you're going to get questions. You're afraid people are going to think you're a hot mess, that you don't know what you're doing. You're afraid that in interviews, you're going to be seen as all over the place. So this fear of social perception is another reason why we don't embrace the hummingbirdness because we're afraid of judgment. This is probably like a 1A as opposed to a 3 in my in the list, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, let's not parse it. <laughs> it <laughs> is that we just like we don't want life to be challenging. Like mm-hmm. unfortunately, we would rather not be tested. And When you're a hummingbird and your curiosity and your interests are constantly evolving, you have to participate in life more. You have to be more aware. You have to be paying attention. You have to be willing to experiment. So a lot of us are like, that sounds like more work than I want to do. And so I'd rather just not be challenged. I'd rather life be not quite so hard. Yep. Yes, that's definitely one. And then four or three or I don't know what number we're on, but (laughs) another one is that way too many of us are putting our very beingness in the same bucket as what we do. Right. And what I mean by that is your existence, your identity. Yes. We are connecting our identity to our work or our passion or whatever. And so if your passion keeps evolving and you don't know how to say, I am a blank, right? then you feel like you don't know who you are. And it's a lot more complicated to figure out who you are and when you don't have a noun to put yourself in 
or a box to put yourself in. And so that's harder. We wish jackhammers seem to have an easier time of it in that regard. But also it's harder for them because they can over identify with what their passion is because they're always focused on it. So you actually have a bit of a potential gift as a hummingbird because you have to figure out who you are in without any regard to what you're doing because your interests are constantly changing. Yeah, everyone wants to just be able to say, I am a doctor. I am a lawyer. I am a robot. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, you're not. I've written about this before. I've ranted about this before. You're not. You are not what you do. So you are on a much deeper level, a collection of values and interests and ever evolving personality traits that cannot be easily encapsulated and stuffed down in this tiny little box of a uh, doctor, lawyer, robot. Mm-hmm. It can't. That doesn't describe anything about you. As my friend Kyle said in our much earlier episode where I interviewed her, uh, Kyle Ramsvig, you can't cure the human experience. She and I were talking about how like, it's kind of like that episode or that scene in Aladdin where the genie is like trying to go from infinite cosmic power to <laughs> itty bitty living space. And, yes. and that teeny tiny little box we're trying to fit ourselves in is the least interesting part of who we really are. Doctor says nothing about you. It maybe tells me a little bit about how you spend your time and maybe a little bit about what you care about. But there are plenty of people who are, people are vastly different, even if that's their title. Even all the people who share that one title have so, so much different about each and every one of them. So much more interesting, so much more nuanced. Yeah, it's not actually a descriptor of the whole you. No. All of the many components that combine to create you. Okay. Very limiting. So... That's why we don't like to identify with being a hummingbird. But I want to talk about what's cool about being a hummingbird, because I don't think most hummingbirds see themselves as cool and interesting and fascinating. But they are. Yeah. So hummingbirds tend to be really fascinating human beings. And it's because they have so many different, interesting, seemingly unrelated life experiences that I'm thinking of a couple of hummingbirds I know, and it's like, you could talk to them, you could have a million conversations with them and keep learning about new experiences that they had, right? Because it's like, oh, I forgot to tell you that when I was in, you know, five years ago, I was doing this random thing for just like a, a summer, or I moved here, or I studied this. Because when you flit from thing to thing in like a hummingbird type fashion, but you really get engrossed in it while you're there and enjoy the process of learning and being curious and engrossing yourself in something and then emerge from it, you have a lot of really interesting things to share. Yeah, you have a rich it. life experience. My grandma was a total hummingbird and I loved that broad. <laughs> I'm sad that she died when I was only 15, but she was so cool. I mean, first of all, she got divorced when she was in her when she was in her 20s, which was not necessarily the easiest thing to do in the 50s. Yeah. And she, and I don't, that wasn't an easy experience for her at all, but she did so many interesting things in her life. Like she went back to school in her fifties to get her degree in psychology, which is like not something women were doing in the seventies when they were in their mid fifties, you know? Yeah. And she took belly dancing classes in middle age and she like went on solo trips around the world in her seventies, just like by herself because she could, she could fix cars, like actually fix cars. I was (laughs) ranting earlier about not knowing how to fix. My grandma knew how to fix cars. Like she taught herself how to do that. And I'm like, none of that has anything in common with each other, but she just did it because it was interesting. I don't think I would love to be able to interview her, but I don't think that she did it for any other reason than she just wanted to learn and she just wanted to have fun. That's it. And that made her an infinitely interesting She was so interesting. Person. Yes. She could talk to you about so many different things. Super fascinating. And those types of people are, I'm not going to say they're cooler than jackhammers because if you're an actual jackhammer, I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. That's awesome if you love something so hard that you just want to do it forever. Like kudos to you. But for the rest of you who might be feeling guilty for not being like that, just know that if you live a really good hummingbird life, you have a richness of experience that makes you a fascinating person and 
It's not to say that you should care what other people think of you. I'm not saying you do it because you're going to be fascinating. It's just a byproduct yes. of what happens is that you have a richness of experience to draw from and you have a lot of stories to tell and you have a lot of interests and you have so many things that you've learned. And that's what living is about. Like living is about learning and it's about growing and it's about changing and evolving. And if you're not doing that, you're not really living. You're just existing. Yep. Yep. You can have such a wide array of life experiences. And to be honest, most hummingbirds that I know, which most people I know are hummingbirds, if I gave them the option of picking something and doing it forever, they would get really restless because they're not wired like a jackhammer. So even though for all the reasons we shared, they sort of wish they could be one because it would be easier, it would actually bore the crap out of them because they are so multi-passionate and so Mm -hmm. multi-curious that telling them you have to do this one thing for the rest of your career or the rest of your life would make them feel so limited and so small and so boxed in that it would crush their spirit. So by accepting your hummingbirdness, not only do you get to be more fascinating as again, as a, as a byproduct, but you get to express all these different areas of curiosity, like in a creative, interesting way, in an uninhibited way, which is so much more fulfilling. So if you're lacking fulfillment, which so many people who find us seem to be, it could be because you are squashing your hummingbird curiosities and interests in the name of trying to be some something that you're not. Okay, so this is actually, I think, an addition to the numbered list that we created earlier. But whatever, I'm not going to go back and edit it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna <laughs> plow through. Okay, people really want certainty. So I was talking to one of my clients recently, and she was talking to me. She's a she has a job that is in ending and it's, you know, it's just in accounting and it's whatever. But she on the side is a writer and she loves writing. She does it for fun. But she'd gotten to this point in the plot of her book. She's writing a book. It's a really good idea too, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't want you to steal it. (laughs) Not that you would steal it, but still I'm going to protect her (laughs) creative license on this idea. And she's gotten to the point where She kind of has writer's block and she feels stuck because she doesn't know where the plot is going. And she hasn't known how to figure out how the plot, where the plot is going. So she's like, well, until I figure out where the plot is going, I can't write. Mm. And I was like, but that's backward because are you going to think your way into where the plot is going? Because you haven't yet. So you're waiting to write until you figure your way into where the plot is going. What if you wrote in order to figure your way into where to the plot write is going? Your way into figuring so it out. Yeah. We came up with some strategies to help her write her way into where the plot was going, to ask some questions of herself and maybe interview her own characters in a way to see mm-hmm. like what are your motivations and where are you going? And she loved that approach. And I was like, why don't we actually think about how that would apply to your real life? <laughs> because that's what people do. They're like, I don't know where my career is going. So I'm going to sit here and think about it in order to figure out where my career is going. But sitting and thinking isn't getting me anywhere. And so I said, what if you took the same approach that you just did with your writing? What if you followed your curiosity a little bit? She had a curiosity about what her character's motivations were and what kind of questions she might want to ask them, quote unquote, if she like sat down with her own characters. I was like, that's a cool idea. Why don't you follow that thread and just see what happens? You don't have to know where the plot is going, but you have an inkling. So follow that. And I bet you something interesting will unfold. She has the same inklings in her life. She's like, well, I, I don't really know where my career is going, but I do know that I'm interested in coding And I don't really know why, but I've always been kind of interested in it. I like languages. Coding is almost, it's like, it is a language. Yeah. And so she just went and downloaded a coding, a free coding app where it teaches you how to code. And she was having a ton of fun with it. And she was like, I think I'm going to take a more serious, but still free course and see where that goes. And I was like, this is the equivalent of just following your curiosity and writing your way into where the plot is going in your own life. Yes. Like we're going to just try things and see what happens as opposed to figure it all out ahead of time because that's what we want. Unfortunately, when we're stuck, all we really want is to know exactly where our lives are going and then we can take a step. Why? Because our fear-based 
like forgive them, but little inner critic pea brain self <laughs> wants us to have complete certainty so that we can mitigate as much of the fear and the consequences and the unknown and the discomfort of not knowing as possible. It doesn't want us to take a step until we know where we are going. And ironically as hell, it is not until you just take steps, even though you don't know where you're going. It's not until you do that, until you figure out where you're going. Like that's how you figure out where you're going is you try stuff before you know if it's going to work. Yes. And you treat life like an unfolding scavenger hunt. Yes. And what I really love about the example you just shared was that she didn't put any pressure on it. It was like, oh, I just kind of take this coding class and see if I like it. Why not? And you know what? She just as easily might have said, you know what? I didn't love it. And then she could just move on. And then she would never have that question. And that happens all the time. Right. That because there's no pressure, it's not like I have to make this work. I have to force this to work because my whole identity and my whole career and everything is lying in in the balance. If you just are following curiosities, it can be, I'm going to dabble in this and see how it feels. And maybe it grows into something really important in your life. And maybe it's like, oh, there was that funny time where I tried this for three months and eh, I didn't love it. But now I don't have to wonder what if. I always was curious, but now yep. I don't have to be curious anymore because I gave myself the space and the permission to try something without pressure. And to me, the no pressure part is hugely important for accepting your hummingbird. Yes. Liz Gilbert gives such a good example of this in Big Magic, where she was had really bad writer's block and she like knew she wanted to write a book, but she just didn't know what it was going to be about. And so she literally like kind of combed through her life and was like, what am I even vaguely marginally curious about? And the only thing she had any interest in learning at that time was gardening. She was like, well, that has nothing to do with writing, but all right. (laughs) So she went and she just started to garden and she wasn't very good at it or anything. Like she was just learning, but she started getting curious the more she gardened. And so then she bought some gardening books. She started reading about plants. And then she got kind of curious about where do these plants come from? Like there's so many different kinds and like, how do they get here? And so then she delved into randomly the history of like the plant trade in the 1800s, like the late 1700s, early 1800s. And that triggered an idea for the novel, which became the signature of all things, which is a really great book, which I'm pretty sure PBS bought the rights to and is going to turn into a miniseries. So I'm like... That's only because she says that was all because I just had an interest in tomatoes. <laughs> like <laughs> I just wanted to learn how to do it. But that's that's the point. The point is that you don't actually get the answers you're seeking until you're willing to take a step towards something you're curious about. And you're willing to then follow the next step and the next step and the next step. Life doesn't just come drop itself on your lap with like a box of 50 answers perfectly packaged up with a very specific guide that says, follow this step first, then do that, then do this, then assemble this. Also, how boring would life be if that's how it works? That would if you're be just so following boring. an instruction manual. Right. That's what you want. That's what you think you want. That's what your fear wants. It's not what you want. Like who we really are wants to be challenged. As much as you think you don't, you don't actually want all of the answers ahead of time because it wouldn't be any fun and you wouldn't challenge yourself and you wouldn't grow and you wouldn't have any learning experiences. What would you learn if you got it all like front loaded? Yeah. Yeah. And kind of along those same veins, I don't, I don't want you to feel like if you follow your curiosity and it doesn't turn into a super popular book that gets a PBS special (laughs) that you're following your curiosity wrong. No, there are plenty of times where all you're meant to do is dabble in something for a little while. And then you have an interesting conversation about it a few years later, Or maybe you know, and like that might be that might be its role in your life. Maybe the whole point is just enjoy yourself. Like sometimes the whole point is to just have fun. And I'm sorry, but if you think that the only curiosities and things worth pursuing are things that are going to become a career or are going to become significantly important in your life, then you're missing the point. Right. I the just point think, is to enjoy yourself. I think your inner critic might be like, okay, okay, sure. I'll try this following your curiosity thing, but really I'm expecting it to turn what into What am I going to get thing. out of it? Exactly. Joy, enjoyment, <laughs> pleasure. That's what you're going to get out of it. Like mm-hmm. the whole point of life, the whole reason you think you want a career that fulfills you is because you're going to feel fulfilled. It's not about the career. It's about the feeling that you think you're going to have once you have that thing. So if you're having fun, 
does it really matter where it's going? If you're enjoying yourself, does that like, isn't that enough? A lot of you are going to push back and be like, no, it's not. (laughs) I'm like, but I think you're missing the point then. I think you're missing the point of life. If you insist on it has to mean something every time and it has to go somewhere every time or else it doesn't matter. Like, no, growing, learning, enjoying, evolving is the point. Yes. So I think it's really cool to share examples where a curiosity turned into some really big, cool thing. It's good for concrete learn. It's like good for expressing the point we're trying to make. Exactly, And sometimes it does. Sometimes those little inklings turn into something really huge in your life. But if it doesn't, that's fine, too. That's great, too. That's just called being a hummingbird. And that's there's a lot of value. There's a lot of power in accepting that part of yourself and letting your curiosities take you over and not necessarily having to make it something because you'll probably be curious about something else in a few months or a few years. And that's great. So let's dispel a few things that people are going to be worried about because like inevitably they will. Yeah. One of them that my client who was writing was worried about was like, oh, I thought it was lazy to just follow random curiosities. Hmm. Like I thought that would just be kind of not very purposeful, not very structured, not very intentional. I'm like, Right. Because like, what? well, what's the point? Where am I going with this? Right. Right. But I think we just described the point. The point is expression. The point is joy. The point is curiosity. The point is becoming a well-rounded human. That, the point that, is that's learning it. what you like and what you don't like. Yeah. And you can't know all of that without experimentation. There comes a point where you can't think your way into a solution anymore. You have to just like roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. And yeah. So it's not lazy. It's actually the most productive thing you could do ultimately is to allow yourself to not know what you're doing, but do something anyway. I think it's quote unquote lazier. I don't want to, I actually love the term lazy and I don't want (laughs) to make it sound like a bad thing, but I think it's quote unquote lazier to sit around trying to think through something instead of act into something. Right. So I think testing the waters of something, even if you have no idea where it's going to go or if it's going to go anywhere whatsoever, is the opposite of lazy. It's very active. It's a very active process versus a passive process where you're hoping you'll just get a light bulb one day and then you'll just know that's what I'm supposed to do. So I think one of the other big fears people have around this is I'm going to look like a spaz. Yeah. (laughs) Like people won't take me seriously. What do I put on my resume? If I just bounced around a bunch or if I just followed my curiosity to this and then that and then way up here and then way down there and way over there, like clearly I'm going to look crazy. Yes, that's that's a concern. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. The truth is, is that most people are going to find you really interesting and they're going to find you really unique. And you're probably going to find I'm thinking of um, a good friend of ours right now who has all kinds of weird, different backgrounds. She's studied all kinds of different things. She's had all kinds of different jobs. She's lived all kinds of different places. And she said, right now in my current business that I'm running, I feel like I use a little bit of everything, right? You end up having such a cool combination of knowledge and experiences and skills that you end up, I think, being a more valuable asset to, for example, a employer because you're not one note. Yeah. And you know, I think that I really do think that the the days of needing to be one thing are pretty much over. Yeah. yeah I think that that, ta- that I think I think well we are we are in the process of moving past it. I think the old paradigm of you have to have a very linear job experience or no one will hire you it's dying. It's dying with an older generation. Yep. And good riddance to it. Because that's not how the world works anymore. It's probably really, it's really never how the world worked, but it's definitely not how it works now. And I think that you can own it. I think that instead of being ashamed of it, you're allowed to say, this is why this makes me valuable to you. This is why this makes me more interesting. Yeah, I think the way you share your experiences has so much to do with the interpretation on the other side, right? If you're like, oh, I'm doing this, but I feel kind of like, I don't know, I'm censored about, you're like apologizing for all the different things in advance then yeah, people might be like, wow, you really don't know what you're doing, do you? And it's not because you have a variety of experiences. It's because you're projecting, I'm uncomfortable with myself. But if you're like, hey, I've I've done this. I'm really good at this. I'm super curious about this. I'm trying to get into this. Then there's like a, wow, what an interesting person. 
wow, I, what got you into all of those things? They're going to get curious about you versus judgmental. And if they get judgmental, who cares? I, I'm also just like, <laughs> I really think that a lot of the time, the people who would exclude you for being a well-rounded, more interesting person is someone you didn't want to work with or for anyway. Absolutely. And I think that there are enough people who would understand you to make it irrelevant. Yep. And I think that, you know, I've said this before. It's a motto of mine. I think you can spin anything if yep. you say it the right way. And yep. I think this is just one more of those things. Another concern, it's related, but I think that it's it's maybe a little bit more legitimate is, well, it not this just kind of shiny object syndrome, like starting a bunch of things and never finishing them. So here's my immediate response to that. I'm not saying you don't finish it. <laughs> this is different than just like being like, oh, shiny object. I'm going to start this project and then I'm just never going to see it through. And then I'm going to start this other thing and then I'm never going to see it through. I actually maybe am advocating seeing it through. I agree because that's how you actually know. Do I want to keep going with this? Right. Right. If you start something, you don't really get a good sense of it. And then you never totally understood was this me? Was this not me? Did I like it? Did I not like it? So I think there's value in when you get curious about something, commit for a little while, really pour yourself into it. Now, you know what? I'm not saying quitting is never the right option. Sometimes like it gets very clear very soon that you're not into it, but that's a very different thing than letting something just quietly fizzle because the next shiny object came along. That's not what I'm talking about. If you get into something and say, I don't like this at all. <laughs> then by right. all means, let it go. But make that be an intentional choice and not a reaction to the shiny objects. Yeah. The difference between shiny object syndrome and following, you know, your curiosity is that shiny object syndrome is like an obsession with excitement and newness. Yes. Following your curiosity can be a bit more of a quiet internal pull and it can be, it doesn't have to show up as excitement. Or shininess. It could be mild intrigue. It could just, right, exactly. And I think that it's more of a genuine feeling when you're actually sort of curious about something. You might not need to be excited, super excited. You might not need to be obsessed with new things. You just might want to dig into that a little bit more and see where it goes. It's more of a desire to just see where something goes I think it's actually here. Here's the difference. It's more about the thing itself than it is about the feel. The newness. Of yeah, because I think the shiny object syndrome is about like the obsession with excitement and newness. Yes. And it's about it's about the feeling you're getting from the thing rather than the thing itself. Yes. The thing That's itself. A good it's probably secondary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it, right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're asking you to follow curiosity not necessarily to jump on every shiny object that comes in your path. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, first of all, we'd love to hear from you about this, <laughs> whether you are a jackhammer or a hummingbird. It's okay if you're a jackhammer. And yeah, I feel like- If you really are, that's great. If you, it, Yeah, if you really are, you. that's great. And we didn't talk about that as much because it's rare and because- You don't need help. All right, you're good. You're pretty much set. <laughs> you know what that thing is. Right. It's the hummingbirds who often feel more broken. So we wanted to talk to them because they often feel like they're doing it wrong when they're doing it perfectly fine. Right. Just different. Right. This is a very freeing thing if you can get to the point where you're like, it's okay to not do anything forever. I can just do this for now. And for now is enough. And if I keep doing that, and I keep following my curious nudges and it leads me from one thing to the next thing to the next, eventually I'll get wherever I'm supposed to be going. And it's not really about the destination anyway. It never really was. It was about what I was learning and what was unfolding along the way. Yep. And that is perfectly okay. And I have permission to do that. That that's, is a very freeing place to be. That's how Rachel and I approach our business and everything. Yeah. Like, this is not like a... I don't know where this thing is going. We're doing this forever, no matter what, come hell or high water. No. No. This just feels good for now. We're going to keep doing it as long as it feels good. And if it doesn't, I'll stop doing it. I'll do something else. And I'll <laughs> wait until I feel curious enough to pursue whatever the is next coming thing. next. Yep. And the next thing. And, and the okay. thing after that. So, yeah, definitely leave us a comment on this. And that'll be in the show, the episode description. You can always 
link over to our site where this lives and drop us a comment. We'll also link to the video where Liz originally mm-hmm. explained this so you can see her describe yeah. it in her own words. If you want to Google it, you can also Google um, Elizabeth Gilbert Flight of the Hummingbird or Elizabeth Gilbert Super Soul Sunday. I might come up with a different video though. So I know her talk was called Flight of the Hummingbird. So yeah, but we'll link to that too. Also, okay, you should, if you feel inclined should definitely read Big Magic because we're going to do a book review of it in two weeks on our episode bonus episode that's coming out on Friday the 29th. We are going to dive into some of our favorite parts of one of our favorite books. We've read this book a lot. I'm going to reread it again for like the umpteenth time. And so it's called Big Magic Creative Living Beyond Fear. It is such a great book for anyone, anyone who wants to live a life... (sighs) I'm not even going to say that's creative because I think you have a different definition of creative than you probably should. And she redefines it. That's why she calls it creative living, not creativity. Right. Because creative living is like living rather than existing. Yes. Is what I would say. So for anyone. Being the creator in your life. Anyone who's more interested in living rather than existing should read this book because it's really awesome. It gives you so much permission to just be be who you are and not care what people think. Do things just for the fun of them rather than for the money or for the acclaim or for the prestige. It's so fun. And it's just such a good little book broken up into really small little essays that are very easy to digest. Yeah. So for all of our fellow book nerds out there, mm-hmm. if you read it in advance, it will feel like we're having a little exclusive book club. Yeah. uh, Which I love. I always wanted to run a book club. (laughs) And if you don't, that's fine. You'll get a lot out of it. Maybe you'll feel inspired afterward to go read it. We're still going to share our favorite parts. Even if you haven't read it, you still get to hear the highlights. But I know some of you are fellow book nerds and you're going to want to join us in that. So we're giving you some advance notice if that's you. Okay. You have two weeks to read that book. All right. Homework. Nerds. (laughs) Or fellow nerds. Fellow Ravenclaws, maybe. (laughs) Any Ravenclaws out there? Yep. Um... (laughs) The Sorting Hat would have given me a choice between Slytherin and Ravenclaw, and I would yeah. have chosen Ravenclaw because it's our choices that define us, Harry, I'm not our actions. Ravenclaw through not and our- through. <laughs> 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 so, okay, we will talk to you on Tuesday with a new blog. Register for the free workshop yep. coming up on the 22nd and go read Big Magic. All right. Okay, we'll that's, that's a lot of homework. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye.